الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق يجمعين وباعث الأنبياء والمرسلين الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب في الشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى ثم الصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على خاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين والشفيع المذنبين الرسول المؤيد والنبي الممجد المصطفى الأمجد أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما عن الإمام المنتظر وحجة الله الثاني عشر ابن العسكري المنتظر ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فإن الله الصادق العليم قال في كتابه الكريم القرآن الحكيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تعرج الملائكة والروح عليه في يوم كان مقداره خمسين ألف سنة سلوات Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Continuing from where we had left off last night in our discussion to understand that final return of man towards his God is reflected by that ayah of the Quran, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. From God we come, or to God we belong, but to Him is a return. And this return plays a very important role in how a person behaves and lives his life in this world. In fact, it would, be, it would not be wrong to state that the manner in which a person leads his life is directly proportional to his belief in his return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last night, when we discussed a few issues regarding the various stages a person passes through from the time he has to move in that journey back, there's one clarification that I would want to make. And that is that as we proceed in these nights, you will find descriptions and explanations that might be very hard to digest. Despite being hard to digest, or with the fact that they are hard to digest, the recommendation is that after hearing these, one should not be overcome by despondency and hopelessness. These are some things that serve to wake us up. There are so many things that are gripping us and and holding us back from leaving ourselves towards Allah that we need to wake up and when these descriptions come we have to be assured or rather we have to be careful that we don't become despondent we don't become hopeless that what is this that we are hearing is there no solutions is there no way out of help is there no salvation is there no deliverance yes deliverance are there solutions are given the point is do we use those solutions or not there's so many times in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, I have given you the solutions, I have told you about things in the Quran. But is there anybody to take heed? We have made this Quran so easy for people to understand. Is there anybody to take heed? And our responsibility over here is to take heed. 
of what is going to happen. So first of all, there should not be any despondency and hopelessness overcoming anybody. There is always a way out. There will always be a way out, even up to the time, إِذَا بَلَغَتِ الْحُلْقُومِ as the Qur'an says, that when the death is right up to here and somebody repents and says, Astaghfirullah, there have been so many instances that people have been forgiven. Imams have told us these stories. Huh? So there's always, up to the time you don't see Malakul Maut, there's always the time for repentance and for forgiveness. That is one. Secondly, in the course of these lectures, there will be certain issues that would be coming up to you. Very difficult to understand, because probably they might not have been told to you before, or you might not have heard before. Whatever has been said, if you do not understand, you do not comprehend, come and ask me. These are certain things that are, that are very, very essential in our religion, but unfortunately they have not been spoken of enough. So should you find something difficult to comprehend, your first point of resort should be me. And then I will explain to you what those things are. Having said this, I just want to, in this context of hopelessness not coming, and since last night was that introductory lecture before I could move on from tonight's lecture to the, to the concept and the discussion and Qiyamah, there is one little hadith that I want to, to, to explain to you. That when the Imams or the Masumin would talk about these horrors that would take place after a person's death, they would not just leave it at that. Huh? Because they were here as guides for mankind. They were here to deliver mankind. And this is what was there at the time of Ashura. That even when Imam Hussain in the state of Sajda, when Shimr was on his back, and that knife was moving on the throat of, of Imam Hussain, there was only one dua that was coming out from Imam Hussain. He was turning to God and saying, Allahumma ikhfir lahum, li'annahum la ya'lamun. Oh Allah, forgive these people, because they do not understand what they are doing. Their life is not to put us into trouble. They have been sent as Mahdi, as the guided ones. They have been sent as Hadi, the guide to deliver us and grant us salvation. So whenever they would talk about all these things, they would also come up with solutions. And there is one solution that they have specifically, and specifically the Holy Prophet has given regarding the punishment of the grave that we discussed last night. In one of the traditions, the Prophet says, you know, all these horrors that I'm talking to you about, it's not that you cannot have a solution to them. There is a solution. And he gives one solution. And these, and this solution he directs towards the ladies. I don't know the reason, but he's directing towards the ladies. And he says, you know, these punishments of the grave that we've been discussing to you about, these can be warded off. Huh? And he says, there are three categories of ladies who will not be subjected to the punishment of the grave. You heard last night the punishment of the grave. You heard last night what would happen when Munkar and Nakir will come. You heard last night what will happen when the squeezing takes place. The Prophet says, this punishment will not touch those categories of people, of ladies, who have these three characteristics. He's saying three characteristics, if found in a woman, can rest assured the punishment in the adab of grave will not touch her. One, a lady who bears the poverty of the husband. That means if the husband is not earning enough, recession going on, redundancy taking place, he doesn't have money. She doesn't start complaining, where has my mother put me into? Which house my mother has put me into? To whom did I get married? I don't have any money. Look at my friends. They're going to Switzerland. They're going here. They're going there. You're not taking me anywhere. Prophet says, if a lady bears the poverty of the husband, protection from the adab of Qabr. Second, a lady bears the bad behavior of the husband. I don't want to discuss what is the punishment of bad behavior of a husband. You have to refer to my Majalis of Dar es But what happens if a person is always doing, you know, kit kit karate? For any small thing you want to pick up an issue, Today for 25 years she's been giving good food. Today there is no salt, you want to turn up the entire plate. Sorry, please, can I? You want to turn up the entire plate. The behavior very rough. The Prophet says if a lady bears up to the evil conduct, to the evil behavior, to the sinister behavior, to the kit kit of the husband, she deserves, she qualifies herself to protect herself from the punishment of the grave. And the third thing, one, Bearing the punishment, uh, the, 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 the behavior of the husband. And second, bearing the, uh, the poverty of the husband. With these contexts that are taking on, we need to move further to understand that when these solutions are given, 
how do we apply them in our lives? But first, in order to apply them in our lives, we need to know what are those things that are going to take place. In order to understand that, we have to understand the movement of a person's life from the, cra from the cradle towards the Akhar. And as we are moving, we find that there are three major bottlenecks that come. One is the life of the world. The other is the light of the Akhar. But if you have a look at this entire life, you find that there are three domains that a person passes through. One is the domain of the life in this world. Second is the domain after the life in the world. That is the hereafter. But this hereafter is also divided into two. One is referred to as the barzakh. And second, this is referred to as the Qiyamah. This life of the world, together with the Barzakh, together with the Qiyamah, form the entire existence of man from the time he's born. Because the moment he comes into the womb of the mother, he's conceived, he comes into the material world. And from there, his journey starts up to the Day of Judgment. As he is moving, there are issues that take place. Issues that were discussed last night, and issues that will come in the subsequent nights. But as these issues come, you would find that there are certain similarities. If we have to understand Qiyamah and the hereafter, we need to understand what are the similarities and the comparisons between the life of this world and the hereafter. And when you look at both these lives, that means before death being the life of dunya, after death the life of akhara. When you compare them, you find that there are certain similarities and there are certain differences. Until we don't understand the differences, we will not understand what happens on the Day of Judgment. As far as the similarities are concerned, both of these lives are real. Huh? So as you and me realize that we are living this world, that Akharat is also real. So you and me will be meeting in Akhara in the same manner as you and me are meeting here. It is a real world in which real things take place. It is not something that you see in your dreams. Huh? That you get up and you sleep at night, you dream that you've stood first in your IGCSE examinations. When you come, you find, no, that's not the truth. That is a world which is a figment of a person's imagination. Again, this is with respect to you and me, not respect with respect to the prophets. Because the dreams of the prophets are always true, ilham, a communication from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But when we have, a, we, we have our case to deal with, dreams are a figment of imagination. Not a real world. Akhirat is a real world. Second, just as you and me in this world feel pain, feel sorrow, feel happiness, feel anxiety, feel troubles in this world, similarly the perceptions are there in the hereafter. That means when you say that there will be fire in the hereafter, that fire will burn exactly in the same way as the fire burns in this world. And the pain that a person will experience in the hereafter will be the same as a person experiencing the fire, burning of the fire in this world. The only difference is that in the hereafter, the senses of a person become so sharp that now the perception becomes more acute, more intense. And this is what it is said in the Quran. وَلَقَدْ كَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غَثَاءَكْ فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ On the day of judgment, we will cast aside all the curtains from you that were there in this world. فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حَدِيدٌ Everything will become very acute. Everything will become very sharp. Everything will become very clear. So at times in this world, a little pinprick is acceptable and you just say, ouch! In the hereafter, if you were to magnify your senses and your sensory perceptions a million times over, that out that you see now would be equivalent to death. Because of the acuteness of one's sensory perception. We will come to this a little later. So one, this, that, the world in this world and the world over there, real. Perceptions... Existing in this world just as they exist in this world. You feel sorrow, you feel sad, you will feel sorrow, you will feel sad there. You feel hurt over here, you feel comfortable over here. You feel hurt over there, you'll feel comfortable over there. Exactly in the same. Only thing, the level of perception increases. So a chocolate here tastes something, a chocolate there will take a hundred thousand times more. The perceptions increases. And third, as you and me live with a body over here, on the day of judgment in an akhra, you'll have a body. Let not be in that the misconception that there will be no body, it will be only the soul. No, this body will be hurt. 
this body will be given the benefits. Those ACs that will be there in the paradise will affect this body of ours. Just as you and me have body in this world, we have body in the hereafter. These are similarities. But then there are also differences which we really need to understand. One of them thing is that in this world the rule goes that as soon as a person is born he becomes young, he's a child, infant, grows up to become a toddler, grows up to become a, a young boy, grows up to become a youth, middle-aged person, old age and death. In the hereafter there is no such thing. In the hereafter you don't have the stages of age. It is one specific age. You're not governed by aging. One no reproduction over there. Here you have reproduction, you have children, you have lineage, you have progeny. There you don't have lineage and progeny. It's just one constant state of existence over there. One. Second, there there is no actions. You cannot do anything to change. You cannot do any action. You cannot do any act whereby which you, by means of which you can benefit yourself. All actions are for this world. All actions are in this world. You sow in this world, you reap in the other world. You sow in this world, you harvest over there. There once Malakul Maut comes before you. There is no other way. Both these angels close these books. And we will discuss the angels, the recording of the deeds. All actions are restricted to this world. We've just got one chance in this world. Once Malakul Maut comes, Quran says when a person wants to go, He's asked to move, he will say, Rabbi Rajauni, Allah send me back. I realized my mistake. Laali Amalu Salih and Fima Tarakt. So that I may do good deeds. In the world that I have left, a sound will come to him, a voice will come to him. Kalla. Inna kalimatun huwaka iluha. You are saying this, you cannot go back. Women wara him barzakun. Ila yom yubatun. This is the one way valve. The moment you cross from the world into our into into Barzak, you cannot go back. One chance we've got. All actions in this world, you cannot change destiny in the hereafter. The only destiny you can change, I can change is in this world. We miss out over here, then we bear the consequences. This is one aspect. Second, death. In this world, everything is governed by death. Everything that comes into this world has to die, a living thing. Whether it's plants, animals, humans, whatever. If not by normal death, then by that command of God when he calls Hazrat Israfil to blow the trumpet. But everybody has to face death. Kullun have sin, the ikhatul maut. He'll have to die. In the hereafter, there is no concept of death. Huh? In this world, there is the mixture of life and death. If there is life, there will be death. This is the sunnah of Allah. This world, life and death intermingled. In the hereafter, there is no death. Huh? Everything is living. Everything is alive. There is no death. All that exists over there is life. Life of you, life of me. You living, I living. Plants living, fire living, the earth living. Everything has a perception. Everything is intelligent. Everything understands. Little difficult to understand? Give me another couple of lectures. I will tell you how the earth will behave on that day. How the fire will behave on that day. Two people standing together, the fire will come and pick up the sinner, leave the good person. Intelligent fire. Not me, huh? This is the hadith of the Masumin. Over there, that's an entirely different realm. There is nothing such thing as non-living. Everything has been given an intelligence according to the responsibility that thing has to perform. Because in this world, everything is governed by the cause and effect phenomena. You cause something, effect is there. If there is no cause, there is no effect. If there is no light, if there is no fire, there will be no smoke. For fire, for smoke, you need to have a fire. If there is no matchstick, there will be no fire. Or flint stones, or whatever. If there are no means to make a fire, there will be no fire. If you want a fire, you need a cause. In the hereafter, that doesn't work that way. In the hereafter, there is no cause and effect phenomena. There is no cause and effect theory. In the hereafter, there is only one cause, and that is the will of God. 
It will tell the fire, you become living. The fire will begin to live. It will tell the earth, you begin to live. You can't say, how can an earth live? There has to be some cause. In the hereafter, the only cause will be the will of God, the command of God. And that's why it will be said in the Quran, on the day of judgment, before the day of judgment, he will call out, Lillahi al-wahid al This world now belongs to me. No other cause will work. The only cause will be the will of God. With this thing taking place, with this understanding of what we are doing, and whatever we've just explained, as we move further, we will start explaining how this earth becomes understanding and gains perception. How does that fire become intelligent to understand whom to pick and whom not to pick? We will discuss this as we go. We are still in the beginning of our series. But as we move towards now the main content, the day of judgment. This is something that we have to understand and digest. Because this is going to base and this is going to determine our entire life in the hereafter. One in this world, death, over there no death. Whom fiha khalidun, forever and ever. We don't understand the concept here. Over there for the rest of our lives there is no return. But when we turn to the Day of Judgment, the exceptional emphasis that we find that Allah has placed on Qiyamah, on the Day of Judgment, on Resurrection, on the issues that will take place on the Day of, ju uh, on the, on the day of Judgment and Resurrection is amazing. I mean, even in the term of Salah, Allah has never emphasized so much. If you go to all the, uh, all the, all the ayats of the Qur'an, 1,000, almost 1,200 verses of the Qur'an speak about the Day of Judgment. 6,236 verses in the Qur'an, out of it are 1,200 verses. One-fifth of the Qur'an only talks about Qiyamah. One-fifth of the Qur'an. All the other usul al -Din, all the other furu al -Din, all the other stories of histories, all the other issues that he wants to talk about, one side, just Qiyamah, one-fifth of the Qur'an almost. Imagine the emphasis and the exaggeration and the exaggerated stress that Allah wants us to understand. Amazing. But when you look at the... Now initially we will start off with very little, little subtle, subtle things till we go into the, the more profound things. When you want to understand and when you refer to the Qur'an, you find there are numerous names of the Qur'an, of the, of the Qiyamah. Numerous names. Ayatullah Makarim Shirazi in his book, Payam Qur'an, volume 6, is mentioned almost... 70 names of Qiyamah. How many do we know? That's a different issue. Fayyid Kashani in his book, Al-Muhajjatul Bayda, volume 8, has given 100 names of the Day of Judgment. But when you analyze these names, you find that you can categorize them into two categories. All the names, you can categorize them into two categories. One category refers to those names which talk about the actual act and the essence of the Day of Judgment. What is the actual act and essence of the Day of Judgment? Resurrection. That means a person living in this world has to die. After dying, he has to rise up. This rising up is called resurrection. This is the fundamental ideology of Qiyamah. So all those names that talk primarily about the actual general meaning of resurrection is one category. So you find the name Qiyamah. Khub Qiyamah itself comes from the word Qiyam. Qiyam means to stand up, to rise. When you say Qiyam, that is what it means to rise up. Hence the name Qiyamah. And it is for this reason that our twelfth Imam is also called Al-Qaim. Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif. Because he's going to rise up and take the helm of affairs in his hand to convert this world which is filled with inequity and injustice to be filled with equality and justice. So you have names like Qiyamah. You have names like, for example, Hashra. Hashra means to gather. Numerous names, many times you will find in the Quran. The day of Hashra, the day of gathering. We will gather everybody. From the time of Adam till the time the last person is born before the trumpet is blown. We will gather them all together. Ma'ad is another name. Ma'ad means the place of return. 
When you say, Wa ilayhi raji'un, you will return to him. Ma'ad refers to that, that you will all come back. Ma'ad. This is one category. But there's another category, which is found in the Quran, and in the ahadith, we don't refer to the general concept of resurrection. They refer to those things that will take place on the day of judgment. Those characteristics that will be found on the day of judgment. Those traits that a person will find on the day of judgment. For example, one of the names of, of Qiyamat is Yawmul Haq, the day of truth. Truth on that day will prevail. Everything, everybody, everyone, whatever truth is there will manifest. Whether in actions it will manifest, whether in deeds it will manifest, whether in characteristic it will manifest. You've heard so many times now when Ayatollah Behjat Marhum passed away, that he was one person who was gifted, who has spiritually refined himself to such an extent that he would look at a person and tell you, my friend, on the day of judgment, based on the characteristics that you've got, you will appear in this form, a dog, a donkey. A snake, a fox. Your mulhaq, your reality is this. You were sent as a human being. You've developed traits of a fox. Your mulhaq, the day of haq. The truth will prevail. The truth is you're not a human. You've got traits of a fox. Come as a fox on the day of judgment. Your mulhaq. There'll be no falsehood at that time. Another name. Your it's a day. Taghabun comes from the word Ghaban. Ghaban means deception, cheating, to be deceived or to deceive. And somebody deceives, it's called Ghabana. He deceived this somebody. Sing Yomut Taghabun. It's a day of deception. Why? Because everybody on that day will be bashing his head with his hands. I have been deceived by my nafs in the world. I was told by the prophets, I was told by the imam, I was told by the scholars, I used to read in the Quran, I would read in the hadith, but I was deceived by the life of this world. Had I paid attention to what they had said, I would not have been deceived to face all these things that I'm going to face. Another one, on that day, every secret will come out. So on the day of judgment, as we will refer, all the secrets of a person's heart will come out. All secrets will come out. So you have two categories of names. One name which talks about the actual resurrection. Second, which talk about the characteristics of that. But, why do you think that one-fifth of the Qur'an had to be devoted to Qiyamah? Khums one ayah. Sufficient, all of us pay khums. I hope so. 1,200 verses of the Quran specifying and talking about Qiyamah. There must be some reason. The reason is this, that all throughout history, there have been individuals who have always opposed the concept of resurrection. Have always opposed the reality of resurrection have always opposed the occurrence of this phenomenon. And in order to emphasize what you think is not true, repeatedly Allah had to say, you are going to come back to us. That day is this, that day is that. This is going to happen on that day. That is going to happen on that day. Do not deny it. I as the Lord of the world am telling you this is happening. I see it coming. They would reject it. And there were instances of rejection. No? There have been instances of rejection. Why do you think every Shabbat Jumu'ah when some, or when somebody dies, you recite Surah Yasin? Surah Yasin, Allah says, وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلَا وَنَسَيَا خَلْقَ قَالَ مَنْ يُحْيِي الْعِذَامَ وَهِيَ رَمِيمَ Think this person is talking to us? He's forgotten his own self. Huh? He's trying to level criticism at us. Having forgotten his own self. Qal, this man is saying, Man yuhyil idham wa ramim. Who will recreate the bones? Idham means bones. Man yuhyil idham. Who will bring back to life this bone? Wa ramim. Ramim means something which is powder. Narrators report. Mufassirin report. 
that in the history of the life of the Prophet, two instances have come up where two individuals have opposed the concept of Qiyamah. At times, the opposition to Qiyamah would take place in the form of a challenge. Allah, the Prophet would say, Fear God, huh? you're going to return back to Him. Be careful of your duty to God, huh? a day of judgment is going to come. So these mushrikeen would say, Oh, you're trying to threaten us? You're trying to warn us? If you think that this life, this Qiyamah is going to come, bring it. فَأَتِنَا بِمَا تَعَيْدُنَا إِنْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ Bring it, bring it. Cause it to occur. Cause it to happen. إِنْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ If you are truthful, bring the Qiyamah. At times they would challenge him. You talk no more, bring it. I want to see how Qiyamah comes. إِنْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ If you are of the truthful ones. Huh? At times they would go further and object by means of proving and bringing forth evidence. Two individuals' names. One. Walid ibn Mughayra. Second, Abu ibn Makhnaf. These two individuals, uh, Mufassirin, have singled out their names. Saying once, Walid ibn Mughayra, or Abu ibn Makhnaf, goes to a graveyard, goes to a grave that is dilapidated, old, observes some bones lying there. Bones, with the passage of time, become brittle. He picked up the bones. He squashed it in his hands. When they brittle, you just press it, they become powder. Then he powdered it. And tradition says he blew it into the air. Wind came, took the entire thing all over the place. Then he turns to his friend and says, Muhammad says his God is going to collect all these pieces and make this man alive. Something la yumkin. Something which is impossible. Allah looking at the Scots, وقال, This man is saying, he for, he's forgotten his creation. Huh? He is now trying to oppose me and say that this God has no power to bring forth these small particles into a bone and recreate the humans. Has he forgotten his creation? We had created him when there were no particles. Now when there are particles, can we not recreate him? The one who created you when there were no particles of bone is able to recreate you after the particles are there despite you having crushed it. So all along in the history you find that there have been people who have been opposing. But in order to support them, and in order to convince them, and in order to show them, no, this is not story. And these are not qisas that we are talking about. Two places in the Quran, Allah has brought about the act of resurrection in this world. Both these things have been shown to two of His prophets. Both these prophets had turned to God and not opposed not putting a question mark, not doubting the ability of God, but out of curiosity, can, how can God do this? See, at times when you want to ask a question, one question is that you want to, to oppose that person. Why are you doing this? Oh, how come you do this? At times you're curious, how come you do this? This is too fantastic for us to imagine. I will pick up one incident. Surah Baqarah, verse number 259. Allah mentions a story. أَوْ كَالَّذِي مَرَّ عَلَىٰ قَرِيَةٍ وَهِيَ خَاوِيَةٌ عَلَىٰ عُرُوشِهَا قَالْ مَيُّ قَالْ فَأَنَّا يُحْيِي حَاضِهِ اللَّهُ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهُ مِئَةِ عَامٍ ثُمَّ بَعَثَهُ قَالْ كَمْ لَبِثْ قَالْ لَبِثْ يَوْمًا وَبَعْضَ يَوْمًا فَانْظُرِ لَا تَعَامِكْ وَشَرَابِكْ لَمْ يَتَسَنَّحْ فَانْظُرِ لَا حِمَارِكْ A huge story, a long story. Where does it lead to? It talks about Prophet Irmiya, Biblical term Jeremiah. In the year 630 BC, a person was born by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. You must have heard about his name. 
the Arabic equivalent is Bukhtun Nasr. His father was the founder of the Chaldean Empire in Babylon. After the death of his father, Nebuchadnezzar ascends to the throne of Babylon. The entire Babylonian forces under his army sets up that Chaldean, continues the Chaldean Empire established by his father. But he had one trait in him. He was a sworn enemy of the Jews. Kabisa. Jews, wherever you find, kill them. He launches an expedition into this very village where Prophet Jeremiah and Irmia passes. Years before that, before Prophet Jeremiah. We're talking about, he was born in the year 630 before Christ, B.C. He died in 562 B.C. Somewhere in between, more probably in 597, this issue take place. He goes to a village, tradition says, complete massacre. Tradition says almost 70,000 Jews massacred at one go. The whole village destroyed. He, he just rampages through the entire thing, kills all the people, moves out, all Jews. At that time, one of the prophets that were there amongst them was Prophet Uzair, Ezra. Allah saves him. Years pass, years pass, decades pass. The time comes of Prophet Ezra, Jeremiah, Prophet Irmiya, Jeremiah. He is passing by through this. This is the story that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, Surah Baqarah, verse 259. He says, He passes through a village in absolute destruction and absolute ruins. When Prophet Jeremiah passes, he says, Ajeeb state. Bodies lying all over the place. Because nobody had buried it. Skulls, bodies, bones lying all over the place. All of a sudden, Prophet Jeremiah is brought to, he, he, he is brought to mind. He reminds himself, there's going to be a day of judgment. Thousands of pieces of bone lying. Then he, he, he just gets a thought into his mind. Allah is going to recreate all of these into human beings that were killed or that had died because he didn't know. How, how? It's too fantastic. I believe. Curiosity, how? Allah says, for Allah says, I will show you. Allah kills him for a hundred years. After a hundred years, Allah raises him again. Angel comes to him. Saying, Jeremiah, How long did you think, do you think you've slept? Saying, I feel... One day, part of a day, I must have slept. Saying, My friend, you're mistaken. You were put to death by God for a hundred years. Look at you. But you were just contemplating how the Qudrat and the power of God will function. I will show you. Because I've been sent by God to show you the power of God. Look at your food. Now when Hadrat Jeremiah was going, he was with his donkey. When Allah killed him or gave him death, it was death given to Prophet Jeremiah as well as to his donkey. Both of them died. At the same time, when he was traveling, he had provisions of food with him. So there was Prophet Jeremiah, there was his donkey, and there was food. Now look at the power of God. Quran, huh? Allah gives him death. After hundred years, when he's raised to life, there is Prophet, Aram uh, Prophet Jeremiah. He's brought to life. There are the bones... Hundred years, the donkey, if the skin disintegrates, decomposes. The skin is gone. The bones of the of the animal are there. At the same time, near the bones of the animal, food is there. Angel comes and says, Jeremiah, you've been living for hundred years. God has raised you again in this world to show you what you were curious about. But He wants to show you His power. Look at your animal. That animal has completely decomposed and decayed. All that remains are His bones. But at the same time, look at your food. Hundred years have passed. The animal has disintegrated and decayed. But this food of yours remains as fresh as it was hundred years ago. The power of God. Huh? All those who doubt resurrection basically doubt the power of God. He's saying, look at the power of God. Two things dealt differently within the same time span. Here your donkey completely disintegrated. Here the rotlis and the Parathas, as they were hundred years ago. Then Allah says, Fandur ila himarik. 
Look, you wanted to see how we are going to do it. Look. And then Quran says, Fandur kaifa unsh nunshe zuha. When next suha lahman. Look how we are going to resurrect people. And then tradition says, as Prophet Jeremiah was looking, the bones the command came from God. The bones started to gather together. They formed into a skeleton. Slowly a layer of skin began to develop. Flush flesh began to be filled inside. A final layer of skin came up onto that donkey that was dead and lying onto the ground. And all of a sudden, neighing and bring it stands up before Erimai. And when he sees this, Quran says, he comes out in speech, he says, وَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنَ لَهُ قَالْ أَعْلَمُ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ As soon as he sees this, he comes out in speech and says, I agree, Allah is, has power over all things. Because before his eyes, Allah showed him, look, this is how resurrection is going to take place. So all throughout history, despite the fact, that people have been opposing resurrection. Allah has given enough indications. But when you come to that, that resurrection is going to take place. There are certain things we need to realize. One of the things that when we are going to go over there, tradition says, the length span of this time of resurrection and the day of judgment. Surah Ma'arij verse 17. It's not going to be an ordinary place that we stand up. Half an hour, one hour, we come, sit, listen to the majalis and go home. Surah Ma'arid says, تَعْرُجُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ وَالرُّوحُ إِلَيْهِ فِي يَوْمٍ كَانَ مِقْدَارُهُ خَمْسِينَ أَلْفِ سَنَةِ One day in which every man will be accounted for every deed that he did, for every thought that came into his mind, for every action that he did, for every movement that he did, 50,000 years of accounting to be done. One day, not for 24 hours, uh. one day, not for one year, uh. 50,000 years, ayat of the Qur'an, fi yawmin kana miqdaruhu khamsina alf sana. One year, one day which is referred to is 50,000 years. You imagine this is the reason. Understand that this is the reason. We need to comprehend this is the reason that it is referred to as the Yawmut Taghabun, the day of deception. When man on that day, when he sees the frights and the horror that we will discuss, will slap his head and says, I have been deceived 50 years, 60 years of life in this world to be accounted in 50,000 years. We are khojas, isn't it? We don't do anything without, without weighing the pros and cons. Businessmen we are. 50 years of life in this world to be accounted for 50,000 years. Is it worth the effort? Then don't be surprised when Imam Ali Nahdul Balaga says, I've given three talaqs to the dunya. Talaq to kathalaq. Go. Because I don't want to be near you. I don't want to be entangled in you. I don't want to be enraptured by you. You will give me 50 years of pleasure, 60 years of pleasure. I have to account for 50,000 years. Beats all logic. And tradition of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Sadiq ala Muhammad Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq. He's saying, Hasib wa anfusakum. Make sure while you're in this world, you take your own accounting. Huh? That accounting is going to come. Before that accounting come, make sure you account yourself. Because on the day of judgment, there are khamsina mawqafan. There are 50 stations where every man will have to pass. Fi kulli mawqafin, miqdaruhu. Every station a person will be held for 1,000 years. According to other traditions and various traditions, the report, the pictorial scenario will be such that on the day of judgment, 50,000 years, there will, be ten, there will be 50 stations. On every station, each and every individual, you and me inclusive, everyone except a few individuals, I will make exceptions, will be standing over there. Every station is named after one wajib act or one haram act. Salat, 
saum khamr zina all of these acts on every station each person will be asked upon each act of for which that station has been organized for which that station has been set up if a person passes through that he goes to the next one if he fails in the questioning in that station for 1000 years he is kept over there punished being chastised till he clears his punishment he clears his offense goes to the next one there he is asked about the next one if he passes he goes to the third one if not he is held back there for another 1000 years till he compensates for his misdemeanors and then he goes to the third one 50000 years this goes on and on and on looks very difficult to understand 50000 years just go back 1400 years where karbala took place just 1400 years karbala took place 1400 years we talking about 50000 years that means if we were to compare the time from karbala to now as we talk about hussein it's just one and a half station that we've crossed. Another 48 and a half stations still to go. That's 50,000 years. I'm still not entering into the discussion 50,000 earth years or 50,000 years of the Akhir. At every station. And it is said that at times the punishment is, may appear to be very simple. Tradition says when a person is made to get out of his grave, for 50,000 years that he will be made to stand over there. Aji punishment bana. For righteous people, it's very fast. Very fast. When in a group the Holy Prophet was sitting. As he was sitting and talking about this 50,000 years, one of the Sahabi says, Ma'at wal hadal hadal zaman. 50,000 years is amazingly long. He's saying, yes, but this is for those who are sinners. For the mu'mineen, for the true shias of Imam Ali, true shias, huh? For the true shias of Imam Ali, you know how much time will it take? Akhaf yakunu akhaf alayhe min salatin maktubatin yusalliha fi dunya. For a true believer, for a real person, for a pious, righteous person, the time that he will be there subjected to the punishment or the questioning on the day of judgment will be equivalent to the salat, one salat that he recites in this world. How much does it time to take one salah? Four minutes? Five minutes? Six minutes? The Prophet says, if you are a true believer, if you are a true mu'min, if you are a true believer of Ahlul Bayt, if you are pious, that 50,000 is not applicable to you. 50,000 is for those people who want to stand up to God and say, you have got an opinion, Allah. I have got an opinion as well. And tradition says, one little tradition, I've left almost 40% incomplete now. We'll continue next tomorrow. Saying tradition says there will be people, when they are raised from the grave, Kum, when the sound will come and the command will come from God. When Israfil will blow the trumpet, when they are raised from the graves, there will be people, tradition says, one leg in the grave, one leg outside the grave, they will say stop. For 300 years, they will be standing in that way. 300 years, one leg in the grave, one leg outside, stand. Over there, you can't say no. Huh? You can't even talk. We will see it tomorrow. Quran says, On that day, لا يتكلمون إلا من أذن له الرحمن On that day, nobody talks. Only he talks whom Allah has given the permission. Because on that day it is the will. The cause of everything will be the will of God. If He wills it, you do it. If He doesn't will it, you don't do it. If He doesn't want you to speak, you don't speak. And you will see that people will not be allowed to speak. Not be allowed to speak, they will not be able to speak. Because they will have no mouths left. Discuss in future nights. 300 years, one leg in the grave. One leg outside the grave. Just stand Imagine 300 years. This is the same body, huh? There's no improvement in the body. This is the same body. Only thing difference will be the perceptions will be more. So what you feel after standing for 10 years over here, you might feel standing there one second because your perceptions are very acute. The pain magnified enormously. Feelings magnified enormously. Those 300 years would look like 3 million years. 
You try to stand at the bus station for half an hour, your back catches up. These are not simple things, huh? they may appear to be simple. You ask to stand for 300 years, one leg in, one leg out. And you say, hi, go this with your house. Hi, ah, it will come. Very difficult. But then these were the things for which the Hus with Hussein went. And Hussein came. And Hussein conquered. This is what he wanted to tell the people. The religion that Yazid is trying to prove to you, sitting on the Khilafat and drinking alcohol, is not what is taught by my grandfather. And hence this entire preparation, Medina to Makkah, Makkah to Karbala, Karbala to Kufa, Kufa to Sham, an elaborate preparation for whom? For you and me, my brothers. For you and me, that we don't have to stand with one leg inside and one leg outside for 300 years, out of the 50,000 years of intense punishment. But this, tonight is the second night of Maharal. In the second night, an interesting incident took place. Because in the second night, this is the night in which Hussein enters the plains of Karbala. That means the prophecies that were done, the prophecies that were given by Jibreel, by the Holy Prophet, by Imam Ali, for today, or rather tonight. And we're discussing this. On the second of Muharram, Hussein enters the plain of Karbala. But an ajib incident takes place. See, at times God wants to tell the people, look, there's certain things that are very important. It cannot be done in an ordinary way. It has to be done in an out of natural way. And this is what takes place. When you refer to the maqatil, you see, on the second, Hussein knows. Hussein knows it. But it is for the others to know. That all the preparation that was going on for this place, that place has arrived, Allah shows it in an, in an amazing way. Ajib. Tradition says that on the second when, when the caravan just entered Karbala, Hussein knows Karbala is coming. All of a sudden the animal of Hussein, as it, going, as it is going forward, stops suddenly. Hussein says, move. Animal doesn't move. Hussein tells Abbas, I think the animal is tired. Can we change it? So they bring another animal. Second animal is about to take a step, stops. Just doesn't move forward. Hussein says, Abbas, can we get another animal? Another animal comes. Third animal, same thing. He's just not taking a step forward. Hussein saying, move. It's not moving. Well, the 72 people of the Bani Hashim and the other companions all going behind. As the news began to start, they started to come forward. What is happening? What is happening? Tradition says seven animals were changed. Seven. Seven horses were brought. None of them would move. Hussein says, what is this place? So the companions, they all together, we don't know. Sing so tried to find out somebody. Now, before we go further, let us realize, let us, let us know this, that Karbala initially belonged to the tribe of Bani Asad. Hussein purchased it from them and then gave it as Heba, gifted it to them. It's my property, I'm gifting it to you. So Bani Asad are very highly regarded. Saying, who, which, which tribe is nearby? They were told the tribe of Bani Asad. He said, try to find some people from there. Some people came. Saying, Hussein says, I'm having a problem. I want to know what place is this? What is the name of this place? Some person says, this is called Qadisiyah. So Hussain says, no, there must be some other name for this place. Saying, this is also called Shatul Arab. Saying, no, there must be some other name to this place. Saying, this is also called Shatul Furat. So no, is there any other name? Saying, this is also called Ghaziriya. Saying, is there any other name? One person from them says, I remember one name was also being referred to by the elders, and that is called Karbobala. This is the land of Karbobala. As soon as Hussein hears this, he turns to Abbas and says, Ya Akhi, Haahuna mahattu rehalena, wa haahuna zufika dimauna. This is the place where we should pitch our tents, and this is the place where our blood shall flow. As the tents are being made, Abbas prepares the tents. Each one comes down as the preparations keep going. 
As the preparations are going, the first of the tents that were there, Hussein tells Abbas, as soon as the first tent takes place, is established. Ask Zainab to go inside. Zainab goes and Fizza goes. Hardly some time had gone when Zainab had entered the tent, when all of a sudden Fizza had come out for some work. All of a sudden Zainab calls out to Fizza, Fizza come here. Fizza come here. Fizza comes running. Yes, princess, what is it? He says, go call my brother Hussain. Go call my brother Hussain. Fizza goes to Hussain and says, Aqa, the princess is calling you. Hussain says, she's just entered the tent. What is the problem? Hussain comes and asks Zainab. Zainab, what is the matter? As soon as she sees Hussain, Zainab starts to cry. She says, Baba Bhaiya Hussain, oh brother Hussain, I don't know where you have brought me, but I find this place very difficult to stand. So Hussain says, what is the matter? She says, from the moment that I've entered this tent, I hear the crying and the weeping of a lady. <laughs> the lady keeps crying, oh my Hussain. Oh my son, I don't know who is this lady. I cannot see her. All that I see is a wailing. At that time, Hussein catches hold of Zainab and says, Oh Zainab, don't you know who this lady is? She is our mother Fatima Zahra. As promised for a promise that she gave to me in Medina. She has left Medina and she is accompanying us all the way from Medina to Makkah and Makkah to Karbala. Say, Alamul Ladina Dalamu. أي منقلب ينقلبون ما تمسين <تصفيق> <تصفيق>